Welcome back to my channel. I'm your host, Steven, and that's my clock behind me. <laughs> I like clocks and watches and cars and clarinets, of course. Today's episode nice little mantle clock. <laughs> I have a big grandfather's clock too. That's even louder. Anyways, today's episode is about measuring tone holes and understanding differences between various models of clarinets. So don't forget to give a thumbs up, subscribe and like and share afterwards. So let's start learning about clarinet design. A real quick intro into clarinet design, which I'll have other videos about it in the future in more detail. Uh, you may look for some previous videos of mine, for instance, the Selmer Mark VI versus Mark VII saxophone, uh, both alto and tenor, I believe. And you can see differences that I do there in more in detail. With clarinets, student clarinets usually have smaller tone holes than intermediate and professional clarinets. That's to accommodate for students' smaller fingers so that the pads of their fingers can cover up the tone holes more e easily and the reach for the pinkies are closer and more upright for their fingers. As you get to intermediate, they may have larger tone holes. They may have more undercutting. Um, many times cheap clarinets would simply have a cylindrical bore and cylindrical tone holes. You get to intermediates, you may have more undercutting on the tone holes and larger tone holes to provide more volume and more sound production. Uh, you get the professional clarinets and you'll get to, well, a lot of LeBlanc ones, older ones, they kind of evolved over time from cylindrical bores to tapered bores to polycylindrical tapered bores. Um, and the tone holes from straight cylindrical to undercuts to undercuts and overcuts. And they're basically shaped now. So they're basically hourglass shaped in the way because there's an undercut and an overcut. And you get to varying sizes of tone holes for the sound production, intonation, and balance and back pressure. When you play, there's always this back pressure that's needed to prevent the reed from slapping on the mouthpiece. If, for instance, the, reg the register hole is too large, what will happen is pressure in the clarinet will just disappear real quickly and the reed will probably slap and you'll get a squeak. So there's a lot of things to design in the clarinet that you have to understand the difference between a student intermediate and professional. And many times when someone plays a clarinet and they say, oh, they all sound the same to me. Usually that's because of the player themselves and related to the embouchure and their playing technique and their style. This is why they always say, you know, get, uh, get lessons from a professional and you're not going to get all the answers in the first day. It takes years and years to do this stuff. And if you're really intrigued and you start measuring and looking at the specific differences, the physical differences between instruments, you can actually, by measuring them, before you even play it, you can probably guess how it's gonna play, how the back pressure is gonna be, what to expect, expect in its playing characteristics. And that all comes in experience. And I've been measuring clarinets and saxophones now, and French horns, for decades, actually. When I come across a new one and I have time, I'll measure it. This particular one I borrowed, there goes my clock again, I borrowed from a friend specifically for measuring it. I've had it in here in the past, but never had the time to actually measure it. Um, and this one we're going to be using for seeing the differences between an RC, the S1, which this is, and a R13. Anyways, we're going to get to measuring this right now. Now, before we get to actually measuring, I want to review what we'll be measuring it with. There's a couple ways you can do this. Since we're just measuring tone holes right now, we'll be using calipers, and there's various calipers you can have. You can have a plastic caliper with a dial on it. This will give you approximate measurements because it'll be visually what you see and how you interpret between the lines and stuff, and also the dial too is very accurate, but we're going to be using a digital caliper. It just makes it that much easier. 
And this one, we can zero in all the time. We can do it in millimeters, which we'll be doing, inches, fractions, but we'll be using millimeters. So we'll get right to it right now. So what we have here is our digital caliper. And I have a spreadsheet, which we'll review later on. But the first thing I'd like to measure is the distance from the top of the body to each mid tone hole. So for instance, let's just take the top drill key. Actually, let's take the register key. Measure right from the top here to the middle of the tone hole. It's about 15.5 millimeters. Very easy to do. And I'll put that into a spreadsheet. I can easily see right now that AR-13 is 15.6 from the top. Of course, how thick it is, we use this part of the caliper. Just barely put the tips in there, measure it out to 2.65. Now many of these pips are not cylindrical. They can actually be tapered. So that's something else we'll be looking at in the, in the future. And some more detailed information. Next, we measure the thumb hole distance from the top. And it is approximately 101.3 we'll use. And measure that out. Twisting a little bit to get the maximum number here, 7.3 is good. R13, this is actually 101.44, so it's a little bit further down. Just like this is a little bit further down. Top trill key, we'll use 30 for that. R13 is 30 and a quarter. Now we know these tone holes have overcuts and undercuts on them. So I'm gonna measure this, first of all, if we put this all the way in, We can see we get 4.28 or 4. Point, we'll just use 4.3, 4.29. That's about the number I'm getting, 4.29. If we pull it out and barely get the outer lip of this, we gotta be careful. There is a there's a bevel in there too. I'll get 4.39, 4.4. So in the middle we have 4.28 and 4.4. And R13 is 4.33 and 4.55. So the R13 is a little bit bigger tone hole there. <clears throat> if a clarinet has smaller tone holes, it helps in projection down the bell, by the way. With all else being equal. This we have here is 5.6. I mean 56.11 for the second trill key. <clears throat> and we have a measurement 5.1 of the inner bore of the tone hole. Now move it around just a little bit so I can make sure 
for my measurement, 4.46, 4.88. Actually, look at that, 5.25, 4.79. That's quite a bit different than the R13. The R13, the outer is a little bit smaller, 5.18, and the inside middle is 5.36. So measure that again just to make sure. We'll do it at different angles too. What you'll find out over time is that um, usually holes are not circular, even on saxophones. Saxophone tone holes I found out are not actually perfectly circular. They're slightly ovalized. as this one is here too. And that has to deal with the way the wood actually expands and contracts. And we're cutting into a cylinder. Try and get some consistent measurement here. As you can see I'm not. We're going to stick with 5.09. That seems to be my consistent measurement here or 5.05 .05 for the inside and the outside just inside the bevel 5.22 how is it this way That's the bevel, 5.27, and I had 5.25, we'll stick with that one. So as, as wood expands, you know it has rings on it. And depending upon how the wood is cut from the center of the branch or of the wood itself, the ring sections will be different and the instrument expands differently. And that has to do with actually why some are easier cracking than others because they're made from the cheaper parts of the wood. Third one. I'm getting about 103.89. I'm going to use that one. Fourth, I'm just going to keep going here, 105.0, we'll go back up. Sixty five point fifty for the throat A, the A flat right next to it, that looks good. Seventy five, we we'll use seventy six. These are about what the um, R thirteen is, by the way, these the throat key locations. I'll measure the tone holes right here now. Four point five seven on the inside.
you can visually see this one is bigger than that one. This is the smallest. This is bigger than that one. This is smaller than that one, but bigger than that one. And this is the largest of these four here. And this is also smaller, but bigger than these two, I'm guessing. This comes out 5 5.74, 5.93. We'll go to the throat key now. Four point six one. Try to get it near the top. Five point one one. The A flat key now. Make sure it's straight. Four point three one. Near the top now. 4.77 top F pad 93.16 which is about 0 0.3 lower than an R13 let's measure these ones out now One fifteen point. One, two, looks good. Make sure you don't scratch the body. 133.28. Keep going here. 147.1 looks good. R13 is 147.8. Gonna measure out the uh, cone holes here. Four point five one. Wiggle a little bit. Four point six two. Four point six two. Hmm. So that one appears to be cylindrical with an undercut. Now I already bore scoped this out so I know which ones have undercuts, which is basically all of them. 4.92 5 .3. You ever have a professor and they want to teach you about shading and coloring? The shape of these tone holes really come into play for, for that. You can check out fluid dynamics and everything, dealing with air pressures and stuff going through here. I actually used to be in charge of a CAD department for Toyota, uh, dealing with CAD, FEA, CFD, and all that stuff. I have a very um, diverse background. 6.59. Six point nine two.
And we're done. We're done measuring the upper joint of Buffet S1. And we'll get to another video where we describe the differences, the design differences between the S1 and RC Prestige and an R13. Anyways, what we have now is a spreadsheet and I'm going to review that spreadsheet briefly here. In the blue here, we have the Buffet S1 and the measurements we just took here. Just to the right of it, we have a BC20, to left it an R13. Academy model, other buffets here, R13s. And we'll be able to compare it directly to a BC20 and an R13 and an RC. And that will be coming in another video. But just to show you, these are the measurements we just took. And we can use that to understand how the clarinet plays and how it plays differently. Of course, there's a lot of things with setup that deals with how clarinets play. If they're stuffy, the pad could be too close to the tone hole and all that stuff. And that requires the person playing it with knowledge to compare different instruments to understand how they're set up and those particular playing characteristics. But for this, this gives us a design characteristic of the instrument itself, which can help us understand what to expect when we play it. Assuming everything is in perfect playing condition, of course. Well, that's all for now. Thank you for listening today. Any questions or comments, please post them down below. Don't forget to give a thumbs up, like, share, and subscribe. You gotta love knowledge, gotta love life, and you gotta love clarinets, especially this S1 we just measured up. See you next time. Mm -hmm.